In 2014, Google spent $114 million on its diversity program, and even more in the years after that. By 2019, just about all the company's 100,000 employees had gone through a diversity training. But the proportion of African Americans in tech roles had only crawled from 1.5 to 2.1%. The truth is, in an era when companies spend billions on diversity, hiring officers, consultants, and trainers, people go to conferences, read magazines, the proportion of African Americans in business leadership is stagnating. And things are no better in education or the arts. So what's up? With so much thrown at the problem, what's been learned about what it actually takes to build an inclusive society and economy? And what do we make of a diversity industry that seems to be thriving while actual diversity, not so much? That's what we're exploring today on The Laura Flanders Show, the show where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. <music> In her new book, Diversity Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business, award-winning journalist and New York University professor Pamela Newkirk describes a huge gap between American rhetoric and reality where racial equality and inclusion are concerned. And she calls us to go beyond lip service. Professor Newkirk, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Thank you so much. So you start the book with our desire to believe that these problems have been solved. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama, Sonda Rhimes, Ken Frazier, what do these people have in common? The first black president, a hit producer, and the black CEO of Merck. They all are people that we look to to tell ourselves we're in a post-racial era, but we're not. No. You want to lay out the problem as you see it? Well, I think in the, in the years after the election of Barack Obama, America was quick to, to wave the banner of post-race America. And many just went with it. I mean, it was the headline everywhere. We're post-race. We're post-race. Um, it's funny that since Trump's election, no one's saying that anymore. No, <laughs> because the reality uh, has always been we've never been post-race, and now it's even more apparent how far we have to go to become post-race. And so um, I guess if there's anything good that has come out of the Trump era is the clarity um, around race that, that we're now having to confront in this country. Well, so are all these diversity programs that we hear about helping? Well, the evidence shows that they're not. Um, the evidence shows that despite the fact that institutions are spending billions of dollars a year on diversity efforts and have been for decades, the numbers have barely moved. Um, whether you look at uh, journalism, publishing, film, uh, to higher ed, uh, corporate America, the numbers have barely budged. Talk in, about journalism for decades. a minute, your field and mine. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't get better. Well, uh, one of the things that I found that was sort of counterintuitive uh, in, in my research is that the, the fields that claim to be most progressive, um, higher ed, journalism, the arts, fashion, are the least diverse. And corporate America is the most diverse. And so I think uh, many in, in purportedly progressive fields kind of delude themselves into thinking because they hold progressive values that you don't really need to have racial diversity because we got this. We're good. <laughs> yeah. That goes for people like me who say, well, I understand race in America. I understand right. white supremacy. So it's fine that I have a TV show. Right. And it is fine that you have a TV show. What's not fine is to look around in all these institutions yeah. and they talk about diversity, but they don't they live don't, it out. So. They don't only talk about it, they spend billions yes. of dollars. Yes, as sort of like a replacement for diversity. Well, let's get to that. <laughs> I mean, you document in your book how there has been change made in America, mm -hmm. just not in this era of Diversity Inc. Right, so we made tremendous change after the Civil Rights Movement. Um, in the 1970s with 
all of the efforts that were put into folding African Americans and other people of color and women into the main of society, we made tremendous progress um, in education and hiring. Um, African Americans like myself finally were even allowed to work in these fields like journalism and higher ed. You're describing a moment where a lot of people were able to make That's a true. breakthrough. Right. And then the stagnation kind of set in. That's true. So one of the important points you make in your book is let's unpack what we had then mm -hmm. that we don't have now. Right. Well, what we had then that we don't have now is the will. There was tremendous will um, beginning with um, President Johnson's Great Society. So going back to the um, mid 1960s. Yeah, so going back to, to the late 60s, the mid to late 60s, where there was this tremendous will, a recognition that people had been, by law and custom, shut out of American society. Um, there was that uh, the Kerner Commission report that pretty much spelled out all of the ways in which um, African Americans had been just denied entry into fee occupations, um, uh, fair housing, uh, medical facilities. I, I mean, there was just the systemic inequality that uh, for the first time in American society was recognized from the very top. And the Kerner Commission report followed massive uprisings. Oh, yes. The other part A of that story absolutely. is there were movements, there were A rebellions. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean. In this country, no dramatic change has ever come without some kind of major uprising. And so, yeah, um, it wasn't just out of the goodness of people's hearts that things changed. It was um, this sense that it was not sustainable, right, because there was so much unrest in this country. And one of the things that's really key um, to, to note is that as African Americans made tremendous progress across every uh, social indicator, they did so without whites losing ground. So there's this sense in, in American society that progress is a zero-sum game, that if they're making it, then we're losing something. And I think that is the, we're, we're kind of pitted against each other instead of seen as all Americans, you know, rising tide lifting all boats. We're fighting each other for, you know, these crumbs, you know, while there's massive inequality that affects people of all races. But it's so much easier to look at race and to divide along these racial lines when really it's the economic issues that are dividing all of us. So in that period since the 60s to the present, we saw a fight in the 70s mm -hmm. over programs like affirmative action. Right. Talk about what happened in that era, right through the era of Ronald Reagan, right. through the 80s, and maybe begin with that Greggs v. Duke power decision in early 1971, something like that, well, which defined what discrimination was in an important way. Well, so there was affirmative action. I think the thing that became most contentious were racial quotas. Um, this sense that you're going to set aside a certain number of jobs for people of color, even though they were totally excluded in the first place, it was seen as a remedy, a, a way to address it. So the Supreme Court has struck down um, quotas as a remedy for racial. So what has happened is every time there is progress based on a remedy, that remedy mm -hmm. is sort of thrown out. And then we have to start all over. Mm -hmm. um, but these remedies had borne results, yeah. right? And then those results become contested. And so we're, we sort of go round and round and round in circles. Uh, we make this progress and then it's rolled back. But we've also changed how we measure the problem or mm -hmm. how we define the problem. Because yes, affirmative action was a policy. It was an approach that was supported from the White House under the, right. in the 60s, but it wasn't ever laid out exactly how it would be implemented. That's where some of the fights have come in. Mm -hmm. But there was also this sense that, well, we can measure whether we have a problem by whether we have equality. Right. And that's turned on its head, it seems to me, in the right. courts, as you document in your book, whereas we now have to show, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a racist actor who did a racist thing. Right. We can no longer consider history um, and, and the legacy of, of racial discriminatory policies um, that we had on the books 
up until the 70s. We can't consider the legacy. We can only look at the here and now. But it is the history that we're living with, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the ramifications of, of uh, history. So, And if we still have numbers like the ones you've described, we still have a problem. Right. So we're pretending that we're operating now on a level playing field when we never quite leveled it. Right. But, but we have to act as if it is level. So in comes Diversity, Inc. Mm -hmm. Describe what that industry, that Inc. part, looks like. Right. So it's the training programs, it's the diversity czars, it's the um, uh, climate surveys, it's the, I mean, we've all, I mean, if you work in any institution, you've come across some of this, right? And, um, you know, mandatory programs, you know, it's sort of uh, what one of the people I interviewed, Cyrus Mary, a civil rights attorney, calls drive-by diversity. <laughs> it's, it's sort of like you check a box, you did it, and then you could just go on. Um, you don't have to actually implement diversity. But people are spending billions on this stuff. There's, Businesses but, are. Yes, but these, these, the, this apparatus is also used as a shield against legal uh, ramifications for not having diversity because if you have what the what the courts do is they look at the mere presence of the apparatus they don't really look at the efficacy of the apparatus so it's inclusion of the diversity program <laughs> yes not inclusion of the actual people precisely precisely and in many institutions the diversity wing of that institution is the diversity most of the diversity czars are are of color or they're women or the LGBTQ. So it, they, they put the most marginalized people in these roles and then they become the diversity in many of these organizations. And they're to blame if it doesn't work. And then they, they are to blame if it doesn't work. And, and Yes, and, and they're not really rolled into the main of these institutions. They're sort of marginalized and it, it will never work that way. You will never achieve diversity if it's not coming from the top yeah. of the organization. So you profile in your book some examples of programs that do work or, or of, of work that mm -hmm. works. Right. And I think of the University of Missouri director who, who says you have to have, get me, correct me if I have this wrong, you have to have uh, leadership, resources, and commitment exactly. at the top. Right. How did that look like you have in to have education? Intention. It, has to, it has to be intentional diversity. Uh, we, we see that at Columbia University where uh, the president, Lee Bollinger, had made it a real commitment from the time he became president. And we have seen the, the needle move on, on that issue. Is it where many people want it to be? No, but you see a real effort. And you well, but the, so the what commitment. did that effort actually look like well, on the ground? As it, well, it, the way it looks is not to just hire a diversity czar and say you fix this. It's to hire someone and say, okay, what do we have to do? Where he's part of the solution, he's not farming it, farming it out right. because it's a leadership issue. It's always a leadership issue. You you cannot um, just give it to some marginalized sector of your organization and expect it to work. What did they do at Coca-Cola under the leadership of Yeah, so Coca-Cola, like with the civil rights um, legislation that followed the unrest, uh, the Coca-Cola, um, they, they were sued and, and, and there was a landmark discrimination settlement. And as a re one of the um, parts of the settlement was to bring in a task force to oversee how they were going to correct um, the pr many problems. Um, an outside body. An outside body to sort of look at what they were doing, where there would be this kind of transparency. Uh, the problems that they found at, at Coca-Cola was that, uh, first of all, in leadership there were almost no uh, African Americans or people of color. Um, they also found that even in the lower ranks, uh, African Americans were paid less than their peers doing the same work. They found systemic discrimination across the board. Um, they found it in hiring, who was, who was even interviewed. They found it in who got bonuses and how, how much uh, they, they received. They found it, so salaries, bonuses, everywhere you turned. And so this task force um, looked at the metrics across the organization, um, looking at who's hired, how much they're paid, um, looking at instances of 
um, you know, bias. And they were able to disrupt, detect, and then disrupt those um, instances in real time. So before a job offer was even made, they would have to like show those numbers and present that to this body. And so they were able, so the, so the, um, the diversity czar was, was just looking at all of these metrics every day. Like anything that touched an employee, there were metrics mm -hmm. along gender lines, along racial lines, and salary lines, and you know titles. And within five years, they they made dramatic change. So I'm hearing commitment at the top. Well, first I'm hearing a grievance brought. Well, yeah, some legal exposure. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then I'm hearing some mandated behavior. Yes. Mandated by somebody outside or a group outside. Right. Then an and, agreement and to, comp to participate. Right. And this, this task force, I mean, they leaned all the way in. They called out every little thing. And um, did, did it matter that Jesse Jackson had a history at the company? No, I don't think it did. I mean, Jesse Jackson became part of the, uh, not the lawsuit, but he called out the company. He was a shareholder, I think. Yeah, he was a shareholder, and as a shareholder, he told them they need to do better on this issue. Um, but no, he wasn't a factor in this. I think um, they had the right leadership at the right time who really wanted to, to do more than window dressing, and they had this amazing task force um, with Alexis Herman, who had been the labor commissioner under uh, President Clinton. Um, they, you know, they just had the right set of people who were really committed, including uh, uh, Steve Bucarati, um, who, who was the diversity, global diversity czar, a white man who really, really leaned mm. into it. And, and so I think people took it personally. Did it matter that it's a global corporation with headquarters in Africa and in other countries? They understand their market. Well, you would have people. thought, but before the lawsuit, they apparently didn't really care that much about how that looked. And, well, maybe they did to the extent that the one uh, senior leader was African-American for the African division. <laughs> so I guess they did. There you go. They, <laughs> so they did care uh, that much, but there was no other senior leadership. So, so talk about color. it. I mean, talk to our audience who maybe have gone through some of these programs. And right. people, regular people have a pretty good sense of what kind of program is poo hockey or whatever the word is. Right. And so the effect, it seems to me, of going through those programs that you know are really ridiculous right. is to kind of belittle the whole enterprise. And it's worse than ridiculous in some instances. It, it's outright insulting. Yeah. Um, and you know, many um, studies have shown that when you do mandatory training, not only is it not effective, but it makes the, the problem worse. Um, that a year after mandatory training, the number of black and Asian women in particular decreases. So, and, and white men in particular, um, are, it triggers a backlash because, the, you know, they feel like they're on trial. This is the workplace. This is not your living room. Right. This is not your mom. So should people rebel? Should they say, I'm not going to do it? Well, I don't know how you do that, but um, the, if you're, if you're doing the same thing and you're getting the same results, then at some point you should know. Change the thing. Change the thing. <laughs> but instead they keep doing the exact same things and getting the exact same results. Be your non-professor self for a second. Okay. Because you write, you teach, you've written several books on exactly this topic. You have been trying to sound an alarm about this. Aren't you frustrated? I mean, I think the book kind of grew out of a certain frustration over this idea of authentic diversity efforts. Like, I just wanted to challenge that notion that you're doing this out of a sense, out of an authentic place. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I did the book to show the numbers, to show how little has changed, to interrogate the tension between the expenditures, the rhetoric, and the lack of progress. Once that's done, I'm done. That's all I can do. Because this is not a problem that I or any African American or Latino or LGBTQ person or woman, this is a leadership issue. And who is in leadership positions for the most part? This is a white American problem for the most part. 
And so am I frustrated? Am I disappointed? Sure. Um, but Add you know, it to the list. Add it to, yeah. <laughs> add, it, add it to the list. You have carrots, but you also have sticks. Right. Um, the Rooney Rule is right. another thing that you emphasize a lot in the book. Yeah, but look where we are with the Rooney Rule. Talk about it. Yeah, so the Rooney Rule, uh, this was Cyrus Murray, the same uh, lawyer who litigated the Coca-Cola and Texaco uh, discrimination lawsuits. He and Johnny Cochran came up with this, they, they did a study looking at the number of black coaches in, a, in, a, in the NFL uh, where the, the players, they were, the, I think 70% of the players were African American and there had only been in the history of the NFL like a handful of, of African American coaches. And so uh, as a result of, of their study, they came up with this proposal for um, that you would, to, to do any um, coach hires or front office hires, you would at least have to have a diverse pool of candidates that you're looking at. Sounds a lot like affirmative action, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so they did, uh, the NFL did agree to that rule. And, and there were fines if you didn't. And there, and, and there were fines, and that's still on the books. But what has happened is you could just pull anybody into the room and say that you, you had a person of color, so what what and they happening? never included women. Well, they have because they they have. But the rule oh no, not in the rule. Women. Not, not in the, no. The rule does not require women. So what was happening is they they were seeing first the numbers went up. I think the highest it went to was like eight, which is like twenty five percent of the coaches um, in in a season were of color. Um, now I think we're down to like three, and so there have been so many violations of the Rooney Rule. Um, they were interviewing people who would have no chance of becoming a head coach, yeah. but yeah. so, I mean. There's a know, lot of ways to get around this well, stuff, yeah. and we see progress, and then we see back. And we the, just saw and the it again. Is, that's just a remedy if you're serious yeah. about doing it. It's not a panacea. It's not going to correct the problem all by itself. The, the will has to be, come from the the team leaders, the, the owners, the it, it, it's not going to happen because you have this strategy. The team leader of the United States right now <laughs> is definitely not indicating that this is a priority. Well, I think he's doing the opposite of that, right? He's pretty much demeaned diversity. Um, you know, he's called uh, you know African countries, asshole countries. He's uh, had a Muslim ban. He's, I mean, he just added more countries to the list, uh, Sudan and Nigeria, you know, to the ban. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to blame Trump for absolutely everything. He's also everything, dismantled but the many of the diversity measures in education. So right out of the gate, he did that. We just saw another reversal with the Academy Awards. You write in the book that, um, you know, in, 1990, I mean, in 2019, there was some progress. And the woman who came up with Oscars So White kind of retired the hashtag for a while, for right. that year. Right. 2020, there, right back there, there again. There we go. Yeah. I think we just slip back into custom. It's, what, it's the way things are done. You know, a lot of this, you know, people think we're talking about uh, overt racism, and we're not. We're talking about the way we live in this country. We're talking about social networks. Who gets jobs? You, you, you hire who you know. You hire who you're comfortable with. You hire who you go to parties with. I can't tell you in New York City how many times I've gone to book parties or, you know, any journalistic events, whatever, and I'm the only African American in the room. So who's going to be considered for some great opportunity? Who's going to be thought of? And so a lot of time, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, a country where we'll, we live in really, really segregated worlds, communities, churches. I mean, we're, this is a segregated society for all practical purposes. But we're also talking about a society where, as you put it, at the end of the book, white people have to be weaned off our preeminence, our myth of preeminence. Right. Well, I mean, and it's a hard thing to do because everything in, in the culture validates that, that worldview, that uh, there's this notion of European superiority, African inferiority. These are not just notions that come out of the clear blue. They were baked into yeah. the academy. They were taught these ideas at 
places like Harvard and Princeton and Yale. So, and then it's reflected back constantly. Constantly, I mean, Pamela, it's, it's a money maker for a lot of people. Do you think we're likely to see Diversity Inc., the corporation, as it were, the business, decline, shrink? go away anytime the soon. The problem is not the business. The problem is the, the lack of, of effectiveness. The problem is that we're putting lipstick on a pig. We're putting a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. That's the problem. The, I, I'm not, this is not targeting the people of goodwill who are working in that field. It's targeting the people who hire them who are not allowing them to actually affect change. The book makes a powerful case. I encourage you to read it. Diversity, Inc., The Failed Promise of a Billion Dollar Business is out now from Bold Type Books. Its author, Pamela Newkirk, thank you so much for being with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We will keep up the fight and keep up the commitment.